Hey, Secrets readers, this is Carlo LaRosso. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, today we have a bit of a treat. We have Secrets founder and editor emeritus and big man on campus, Johnny Johnson Jr. And we also have with us the, there he is. And we also have with us uh, Stacy Spears and Don Munsell of uh, the Spears and Munsell uh, Benchmark and Test Disc fame and awesomeness. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. Oh, fabulous, fabulous. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we wanted to maybe uh, talk about a couple, a couple different things. Um, but I think first we wanted to um, maybe touch on the uh, the Spears, the Spears and Munsell test discs themselves, since you guys have recently released the the latest iteration of it um, for ultra high definition. And um, but I guess uh, I guess maybe just to start at the most basic question. Um, since for folks who aren't aware, what basically, you know, explain, can you kind of explain what the purpose of the uh, the benchmark discs are? And like, in, even from its beginnings, I guess, and if you don't mind. Well, in a way, it sort of spun off the DVD benchmark from Secrets. When we did that, we didn't actually have the content we wanted to do the right tests. And so we ended up building our own tests which has allowed us to basically evaluate and test DVD players and displays and AVRs and anything in between. At least that's how it started. Okay. So it did sort of spin off originally from the, from the old secrets yep. uh, DVD benchmark test that we used to do. Okay. Yeah. That, that's actually what brought Don and I together. So I'll be darned. Okay. So that, that is what happened. All right. I was never a hundred percent sure of that. So that's, that's great. Oh, okay, cool. Cool. Um, so yeah, let's, let's kind of start at the beginning then. Um, so you it, it, you guys didn't have the the sort of tests you were looking for or that that you thought were necessary at the time, and so you decided to go ahead and just just create them, I guess. Well, so the should we go back to where the DVD benchmark started, then where sure, Don came in? Sure, let's go ahead. So uh, I don't remember what year it was. I want to say it was somewhere around 97, 98, because I'd moved to Washington at that point. And uh, Meridian had sent me a $20,000 DVD player. And I figured I didn't want to just put in the fifth element and talk about it like other people did. I wanted to actually evaluate it properly. And at that time, the only proper tool was the Tektronix VM700. But I think to rent it was something like $2,500 for a week. And oh my gosh. Okay. I didn't really have the money to rent that. And so I talked to JJ about it. And we decided, I guess, to get a bunch of DVD players, and then we'd evaluate all of them at once. So I thought, okay, if we're going to do video, we should also do audio, uh, maybe evaluate the remotes for usability, uh, DVD audio, and a little bit of progressive scan. But the progressive scan was sort of very basic at that time. Mm -hmm. And so once we published those, uh, well, let me step back. So I actually went to Joe Kane, and I said, hey, I want to mm -hmm. do this, this, these reviews. And you know, do you have any recommendations? And he pointed me to a Perfect Vision article he did, where he did that with laser disc players. And he said, okay, use that, yeah. you know reference that. And so I sort of used that as the, the the baseline, so to speak, or where to get started. Except uh, the problem was there wasn't a lot of actual test patterns. So Joe had a couple okay. discs. I think Avia was out at that time. And maybe even Avia Basics, but there was no Avia Pro. So we made okay. do with what we had. We did the original benchmark. And then that's when Don contacted me. Because mm -hmm. he'd read the articles. And I'll let you go from there, Don. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what was in the uh, what was in the email, but it was sort of like I, I read the article and I was like, this is good. But I mean, there's a bunch of, you know, I had some thoughts anyway. And something about what he said made me think, I wonder if this, he's at Microsoft because I was at Microsoft. So I just t started typing Stacy Spears into the you know email system and it filled out, you know, it auto completed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, great. And I think I might have, I might have written to the other Stacy Spears, <laughs> who then put there's me in touch with you. Yeah, there, was. there was, there's a woman named Stacy Spears at Microsoft, oh, who there was at the time, and she always got Stacy's mail and vice versa. So I emailed, asked about the DVD benchmark, and she's like, oh, I think you mean the others. Anyway, so finally <laughs> yeah. emailed him and said, you know, here I have some thoughts, blah blah blah. And we had lunch, and uh, we were talking about things that. We, that could be done, and I think that well, we, was when we, we had we had met at uh, Magnolia Hi-Fi, I think, and brought a bunch of discs in and went inside their oh, big home right. theater room, closed the door for an hour, and just you know played around. Yeah, yeah, and we were looking at different artifacts and trying to figure out how you'd build tests that would show those artifacts. I think, I mean, it's it's all dim recesses of memory, but yeah, and uh, I don't know. I had pro, you know, I had background writing graphics programs and things and I thought, you know, how hard could it be to write, you know, software to make test patterns? And the answer was, was 
Well, that's what led to basically the progressives can't shoot out at secrets. Right. Oh, wow. Right. Well, uh, what Don had said was, I'm going to go home and write a tool to basically rip the flags off a DVD to see you know if it's encoded as progressive or not, if it's flagged okay. correctly. And then we had some DVD players, some that would read the flags, some that wouldn't. And we used that to sort of figure out what players were doing. Interesting. And we oh, both wow. basically, every time we'd find an artifact, we'd set the disc aside and we'd use that to sort of evaluate the players. Now, th this, this, this would be like much more involved than, I mean, at, at this time, I mean, this was like the bad old days of LaserDisc. And I know there was some LaserDisc sort of uh, benchmark things where there was like test patterns and, and some basic stuff like that. This is much more, this would have to be like a whole other step beyond that, basically, at, at for the beginning well, of, of DVD and stuff, right? Yes, I'm really interested in how Progressive Scan really worked because all of the marketing materials about Progressive Scan were different kinds of lies, you know. I mean, like most marketing, but tell us how you, you really know, feel, Don. Yeah. It was beautifully <laughs> written material. Yeah, absolutely right. No, like Sony uh, had this manual. That about... Sony white paper where they described their deinterlacing system, and we proved that it was a hundred percent false, just totally, totally made up out of nothing it was but it was beautiful crazy. marketing though it was beautiful yeah marketing. Uh, yeah absolutely had diagrams and you know they put a lot of money into this uh, and, you know, we didn't anyway but interesting uh, but that so, led to the progressive yeah. scan shootout because basically from there we had found a bunch of discs like the big lebowski trailer and because he had kids he had blues clues and various movies we saw we tried to identify so we found we find the same artifact across a bunch of movies, and then we just use one version of that movie for the progressive scan shootout because it was the same artifact. Like one was alternating uh, progressive frame flag, which I mm -hmm. think a couple of Pixar movies had and Titanic had. That was one artifact. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there were movies that had been they were fine progressive scan. You know, they were easy to convert to progressive scan, but they just were flagged all wrong. Okay. And that wasn't really a problem for normal DVD players. The flags were more of a compression efficiency flag. Um, at one point, we we met the because you know being at Microsoft was really helpful because you you'd end up meeting people from all kind all over uh, the yeah. industry. Yeah. At one point, Leonardo Coriglione, the head of MPEG at the time, came through to talk to some people in Microsoft um, a audio, you know, the the media team, and we basically cornered him and said, you know, what shouldn't MPEG be a little more hardcore about like the usage of this flag? And his basic attitude was like, look, you know, we describe the encoding. We're not in charge of making sure that everybody follows it. Like, right, and that we're, was in we're not enforcers, basically. Right, that was in reference to the chroma bug specifically. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but the chroma bug was also, you know, to some extent, came out of the fact that stuff wasn't flagged correctly. Um, and so some, I think some programmers threw up their hands and said, you know what, we should just ignore this flag and never, it never seems to work. And if you ignore the flag, you also ignore the two, the two things the flag tells you. One is that the image is actually a progressive scan image. And the second is that the chroma upsampling is handled differently on progressive and regular. So that led to, yeah. So that, well, that was the chroma bug. There was also a second thing, which is that even if there's no bug, there's just the uh, chroma upsampling. What did we call it? Chroma ICP. Interlace chroma problem. Interlace chroma problem. The interlace chroma problem. Yeah, which is basically like you, you know, it's just the problem that interlace chroma is always going to look funky. Well, I was thinking about this earlier today because back then, right, DVD players put out interlaced video, and even putting out that first 480p, there was a lot of you know uppidence or whatever you want to say, the industry was like afraid of progressive scan output. Mm -hmm. And then when the players started offering scaled output, that really freaked them out. Mm. But now today, everyone has an Apple TV, it's streamed, it's all progressive, or it's all at higher resolutions. It's a much mm -hmm. different time, but it was just so different back then. And it wasn't that long ago. And that's probably what started getting people, you know, all freaked out about copy protection and and, and a few other things, that, which eventually led to the whole, I guess, HDMI working group and all that stuff but that's that's a whole that's a whole other kettle of fish i guess right because the, the progressive scan shootout sort of predates hdmi right yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. oh my goodness so these yeah. these tests basically were not were not like sort of the easiest things to put together i mean you guys obviously had to do a ton of research and a ton of uh a ton of figuring out and trial and error in order to get 
Right. So we, we had some players that we knew that read the flags. We had some players that we knew that looked at the image. Mm-hmm. And then we basically used that and the and then we used Don's tool to dump the flags on the disc. And that mm-hmm. allowed us to sort of figure out what a player was doing. Gotcha. Sort gotcha. of basically is a brute force reverse engineering. Okay. And we also borrowed some patterns from um, a Microsoft test disc that Andy had Andy Rosen. put together. Andy Rosen at Microsoft. And then we deliberately took some of those patterns because we had access to the original. Well, we had a, we. I think we we got the original MPEG files, and we changed our tool to actually flip the flags, so we could create patterns. That was the first thing that we did was take motion patterns, and flip the flags on and off. Like we could recreate any kind of problem with the MPEG just by changing the flag pattern, and then we could see, we could see easily what the what the um, this, the player was doing because we had these patterns that would show immediately if they switched to interlace uh, versus progressive, you know, Bob versus weave type the interlacing. Mm-hmm. So it was like a really easy way to tell in like two seconds, whether a player was using um, flag based de interlacing or, you know, reading the image de interlacing because one way it would turn into a mess immediately. And then the other way, you know, and that's that's the essence of a test pattern. You find an artifact, and then you try to design a pattern that will make that ar- artifact as obvious as possible. Something so you can just look at the screen and go, "Yep, it has the artifact," or "Nope, no artifact." Yeah. You know, this was the uh, benefit of being the first AV publication on the internet anywhere in the world to do this kind of stuff. So you could kick some butt and get things done. It's what we did. Yeah, that's pretty well. well. I, I was trying to remember earlier. Um, because I think I joined Secrets. It was before I moved to Washington, and I moved to Washington in 97. Someone was like 96 or 95, but I'm trying to remember how I found Secrets because there was no Google back then. I think there was Hotbot was a search engine. Uh, I don't know what else was out there. And I don't even think AVS existed back then. Yahoo was yeah. before Google. Mm. And well, all those. Been... I don't remember how we met. Yeah, I just remember I found Secrets one day. But again, like I said, this predates Google, predates all the internet forums. Although back then it was different because... Maybe you found it on a Gopher server? <laughs> <laughs> Netscape Navigator? What? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, I don't, uh, yeah, it would have been Netscape, I guess, or what other... Because I don't think I was even using IE back then. So I don't think IE existed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sidebar, we are old. And a couple other guys, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. Oh, man. But Kyle I mean, Miller, Brian Florian, yeah. You, you guys, I mean, uh, but what you guys, obviously you guys weren't getting, you know, this was like a, a hobby thing or a sideline yeah. or something. This wasn't like, you know, your full-time job or whatever. And the fact that you guys just went ahead and kind of took this and ran with it, you know, A, is 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 pretty is pretty amazing. Um, like I said, JJ literally, you know, took 2500 out of his pocket to rent the analyzer for a week for us to use it to actually do the tests. Yeah. Sure. I, don't even think you were, I don't think you had advertisers back then or you might have had one or two. Mm. No, nope, didn't have any advertisers. Yeah. It was out of pocket. Did you, man? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh wow. So, uh, so then, okay. So we now you, we have we have the tests you guys have came up with, come up with and 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 doing the stuff with the flags and everything. So what was the what was the response then from manufacturers or from uh, what what kind of feedback did you get from them? Was it like? Uh, you know, oh wow, this is cool, or, or was this like some, some bit of a hostility, or what? What, so, what did you get? So there's definitely so we got hostility from manufacturers and from consumers. So really? if you if you spent money on a high end player and we pointed out the problems with it, they got very defensive. Okay, because yeah. they didn't see those artifacts <laughs> on that player that they spent twenty five hundred dollars on. So the Meridian boys hated you guys. <laughs> Well, theirs actually measured really well. They just had the worst chroma bug ever. Oh, wow. From, from a signal-to-noise ratio, it was way ahead of anybody else. Mm-hmm. But horrible chroma bug. Mm, but they also only did interlace. They didn't do progressive. Pure interlace for a $20,000 player. Mm-hmm. Going, going back to the manufacturers, um, did any of okay. them sort of sort of kind of jump on the bandwagon and, and sort of use this as like uh, as like a way to improve their actual product at all? or So Panasonic, uh, the... Uh, Itani Sonic, Panasonic, he was yes. really happy. So because so Panasonic, when they built our players, they were never mm-hmm. allowed to talk about what was inside it because it's a Panasonic player. Therefore, everything inside is Panasonic. Mm-hmm. So when we pointed out the RP56, I think, had a Ferruja chip inside because he was never allowed to say it. He was very happy because mm-hmm. it actually increased the sales of their player. 
That's we, we were that's a little nervous funny. because we also badmouthed our high end player, which had the Genesis chip. <laughs> Oh, but he didn't seem bothered by that. He was just so happy that we talked about the low end one. That's funny because I ran into Itani San at uh, at my, I think one of my first CES that I'd gone to. This may have been like 2016 or 2015, and uh, never met him. But he saw like my shirt that had the logo on it, and he said, "I recognize you. You guys uh, DVD benchmark, right?" And I said. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the DVD benchmark. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you guys were those were great. That thing that that helped us. That helped us very much with it because he, then he explained how he was on the helped you know with he had patents and helped with the development of the DVD and all that stuff. But he said that yeah, that it it helped with finding the chroma bug and a bunch of other things. And he said it was super helpful. It was just like the nicest conversation I had with this man. I just I had no clue who he was. And I just met him, but he was he was very cool about it. I'm now, was he? To, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Was he at techniques at the time? Because he took he, over techniques. He had just started. Uh, he had just started with techniques. So uh, I'm actually gonna, uh, trying to get a hold of him and see if I can maybe have a chat with him and if he'll, you know, go on record and I can uh, I can maybe include it in this little in this little thing if, if possible if uh, if the powers that be will will let us do that. But, but uh, there were there were two manufacturers that weren't happy. One was Toshiba. And mm -hmm. I remember uh, when I met the person at Toshiba, he was just, he was just like breathing heavy. He was upset with me. He, customers were calling, wanting to return their player because they had the chroma bug. Ooh. I'm like, well, that was the point. Because we'd actually went to manufacturers first, said, hey, you got this problem. Can you fix it? They didn't care. Mm -hmm. We went to the decoder makers to talk to them about the problem. They're like, well, it's not us. It's their implementation's wrong. Of at course. least for one of, the, one of them. And so we're like, fine, we'll just publish an article on it. Let the customers complain. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, there was a decoder manufacturer that said, hey, we're feeding the flags out of our chip properly. And then they're feeding it into a different chip that's that's doing the combination and, and uh, you know, producing the progressive output. If they're ignoring the flag, you know, that's not on us. We we're telling them what the flag is. They're just ignoring it. And yeah, it was everybody was pointing fingers at other people and saying, you know, this is not it's not us. It's somebody else. And mm -hmm. yeah. But there was a small high-end company named Camelot, and they had repackaged the RP56 in a $3,500 player. Mm -hmm. And I think they sold every one of those players after the bench oh, the wow. progressive game shootout came out. Wow. So they yeah, were it was happy. The top, it was the top-ranked player in the benchmark. It ranked essentially the same as an RP56. Plus, it had a few other little features. I don't remember what they did. I mean, it was, you know. Heavy. The, <laughs> it had big wires inside. It basically had an RP56 inside of a brushed aluminum, you know, case with, like, big hefty wires. And they changed the audio output section to give to put in bigger capacitors and some other stuff. I don't remember. They re redid the audio because, really, they were selling it to audiophiles. They were an audio high-end audio company, and yeah. this is their first DVD player. So they basically reworked the whole audio amplifier section to like high-endify it. I don't know. I'm not a high -end <laughs> high it. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> Sprinkle some pixie dust on it, and yeah, exactly. All that good stuff. Right. Well, they well they upgraded all the components. Power supplies. Yeah, power supply cleaned yeah, up yeah. a lot of stuff. They removed the a couple extra shells that were there. Yeah, didn't we talk to the designer of that? And he said, I didn't know anything about the video section. I just hooked it up to the <laughs> back of the box. And, you know, and yeah. the fact that it had it was a really good progressive scan DVD player was total luck. He just, the, yeah. the Panasonic RP56. It was just great. Yeah, yeah, it was like a, a good player you could get his hands on easily and That's worked funny. out. Yeah. So uh, in terms of other manufacturers, like, say, Denon and Oppo, would, did they, did so they come Oppo into the picture didn't... at some point or... Oppo didn't exist back then. Right. Okay. That was a bit early on then. Okay. And so basically, I think Don and I left by that point, but we trained Chris Deering on how to actually run the progressive scan tests. And so Oppo had reached out to us, but we were basically busy. And so Chris had worked with them to actually build the first DVD player. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. I see. And then we, okay. when they were working on their first Blu-ray player, that's when they came to us to ask us to actually create a disc for the player. That's what's going to be my next question. At what yeah. point did this transition from, say, you know, the, the, uh, the tests basically based online with secrets to to an actual DVD, actual physical DVD and set of discs. So the first DVD made was actually for a company called DVDO. They had a, mm, a yeah, 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 yeah. The VP50 video processor, and so we made a DVD for them. At first, I thought I was just making patterns, but somehow they're like, "Oh, we want you to author the disc too." And I never authored a disc, so mm -hmm. I remember buying some software online, and it was software that let me do the things I want. So, for example, if you go to a, you know you got a menu of six items on it. You click on the menu item, it plays the pattern. When you return to the menu, by default, it goes to the first item. And so you have to actually write code to go to the menu you were just on, the element. 
Oh, wow. And so most of the software didn't do that. So I found a package that let me do that. Because okay. when I return to a menu, I want to be where I left off, not at the top right. again. Right, exactly, exactly. Something uh, subtle. Even Blu-ray to, the, to this day, you have to program that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That is one of the most annoying things about it, actually. Oh, my gosh. Huh. So and, and so that started then with the original the original sort of DVD benchmark. And and at this point, and until with, with the... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So at that point, um, we created our own patterns, but we'd also licensed content from uh, Super Speedway basically that okay. race car scene on the right, track. Right. And because we'd had all those, we'd created all the tests for DVD benchmark, like the, uh, the repeating progressive frame flag. This is where we had to, we didn't have that encoder that made that bad flag. So that's where Don wrote a tool that altered the flag for us. Uh -huh, so we okay. encoded it. It was correct. And then we purposely broke it. But if you're doing the a player ignores that, then it just plays fine. So it allowed us to see what a player did. But what's okay. interesting is on our first Blu-ray disc, we put that file on the Blu-ray disc and every Blu-ray player played it correctly. So that's why we included we included a bundled DVD as well with the same file on it, the exact same file. And when the DVD was playing, then it, mis it behaved as it was expected to behave. It didn't fix it. Oh, okay. So, so it was interesting the performance on playing the same file off a Blu-ray disc was different behavior than playing it off a DVD. So same player, but different disc format if i'm understanding yes. correctly when it played the blu-ray disc no problem but if you put a dvd in it like you know we all have dvds and put a dvd in it to see if it was backwards compatible and it would play it incorrectly then yes well i mean incorrectly but it's how we expected it to play how we expected it to play yeah. okay gotcha gotcha and huh. that's sort of what led to us even including the bonus dvd okay okay so now, now with with the latest iteration how many how well how many iterations is that does that make that you guys have done now so under us, we had the first edition, which was originally bundled with the Oppo player. And then they're like, you can sell it standalone as well. So we did that standalone. Then we came mm -hmm. out with the second edition, which included 3D. And that's where we actually added the audio test. Because the first disc was just pure video. It was very simple. Because mm -hmm. we wanted stuff on there that you didn't need any equipment. You could do everything basically hands-free, so gotcha. to speak. Gotcha. So the second one, we put the audio tests on there. Then we included a lot of video tests. And that, like I said, that was 3D. Mm -hmm. And then the third one was our first 4K disc, which was going back to like the first disc because it was originally targeted at uh, the press. We were going to do that disc and then a year later come out with the kitchen sink version. Mm. But that disc, uh, when the kitchen sink version was supposed to come out, was about the time we finished that disc. <laughs> so it yeah. took longer. So we ended up putting more on it. Still didn't have audio like Atmos, but we put more on it and we sold it to everyone. And then it was supposed to be a year later after that one. And it took four years to get this this new disc out, which is actually three discs. Yeah, it's 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 a beast <laughs> of a set, actually. Oh, my gosh. Very, very cool. Um, OK, are you guys uh, is there any need at this point for like, a, I mean, an 8K set or is that like. Well, someone would have to make an 8K disc right. or an 8K, an 8K yeah. way to play files. Some kind of a format that isn't streaming. Mm -hmm. um, so like right now we're we're talking to um, a Kaleidoscape or oh, a 4K okay. version or an HD and a, and a 4K version to play on there. So if they ever have something in the future, we could do it that way or an Apple TV if they ever do it. But I think Kaleidoscape will probably be the next iteration of something. Oh, man. Okay. Interesting. Huh. I think consumers will be interested in 8K because you really need it like a 98-inch TV and sitting about six feet away to be able to see, to see the picture. So the 77 inch 8K TV from LG, the OLED, 4K actually looks better on it. And I yeah. think it's because it's being oversampled. And that's a 77 inch. Um, but so uh, Value Electronics has their annual shootout. And I think that's the first time anybody there got to see real 8K footage from a red camera because uh, Phil Holland brought a lot of his aerial footage. And when you see the aerial footage of New York, for example, flying across the buildings, you can definitely see the difference between 4K and 8K. Really? But, Beyond detail like that, it's it's hard to see. Interesting. Okay. But a lot of the the high end. The, it the really AK. has to be. Sorry, it really has to be shot with a digital camera in order to get enough detail. Like people love to talk about the purported resolution of film, but there's no film scan that's going to show any detail at 8K. Mm -hmm. well, if you have an IMAX, uh, maybe, you need like IMAX. IMAX. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. true, true 70 mil IMAX because mm -hmm. of the, the size of the film. Yeah. Well, film has this weird MTF curve. Anyway, I'm sorry, this is all yeah. side side track, but but um, one of the reasons you want AK is really for acquisition. Just like with audio, where you want to start with twenty four ninety six or twenty four one ninety two, you want to start your film capture at a higher resolution as well, or your image capture. I'm seeing more and more audio on uh, Cobas that's been in new 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 music that's been recorded at twenty four ninety six or twenty four one ninety two. Uh, 1644 is disappearing. 
because yeah. there's no point in well way back, back when i was working in this is cheap Way back when I was working in computer games, all the raw files that you recorded would always be at the highest resolution, bit depth, and everything that you could get because you're going to be adding effects and remixing and doing all this stuff. So you want as much uh, bandwidth as possible, as, yeah. as possible, because you're going to eventually mix it down to, you know, 44 or 48. Um, so people have been recording in the highest possible bandwidth they could for years and years. The question is whether that's a useful delivery format as mm -hmm. as bandwidth becomes easy to come by you know and uh, like on these shiny discs and you know bandwidth is cheap so especially for the audio so i'm putting lossless 96k audio is like sure why not let's just do it you know so yeah. my car audio system you haven't seen it yet but no, no you didn't actually take a look at it so i put a high-end car audio I system at it. Unless, are, are we talking about the last audio system? Well, the one in the prime right now with a two two one thousand watt arc audio amps, where it's a fully active yeah, system, probably, all time yeah. aligned, and yeah. Well, well, anyway, know, so I haven't listened to it. it we uh, just, but with with CarPlay, if you do wired CarPlay, you get lossless audio across wired CarPlay. But if you do wireless CarPlay, they re-encode it on the fly, and so mm. you get compressed audio. Mm. And do you hear that difference? If I were to do that, so if you were to do a blind test of For what I spent on that call, wired or my wireless, you, is all the difference? Is that what you're, hint of that what you're asserting? <laughs> I'm just saying for the money I spent, I want to get my lossless audio through. I, sure. I can hear the of difference. Of course. Yeah. Lossless, lossless. 24 yeah. minutes. Because I've, I've compared the sound coming off of Cobus for recordings of, of my favorite pieces, both playing from a... Uh, 2496 audio file, you know, wave file, uh, versus Koba streaming that same recording, and I can hear a difference because I, even though it's supposed to be 2496 coming to off of Koba, I know they're cutting some bits out of there. I can hear it. And is that like Cardi B or? Yeah, That's Cardi B. <laughs> <laughs> it just it seems like a little bit of a loss of presence, loss of. of uh, substance you know it just seems like something's missing but i don't know what it is so yeah, yeah something tells me jj is beyonce and cardi b and uh <laughs> and then a little kim and all those folks yeah i don't think so <laughs> oh man so I'll, that's that's very that's very cool i mean that's uh john do you have any other questions to ask about the about the the benchmarks or the or the discs in general or um, cause I think I kind of, no, I just, of... just the, the one thing that I had suggested to uh, Stacy maybe a couple of weeks ago was to add some, uh, resolution files that have groups of pixels starting out two by two and then four by four and five and six. So, so on. we have a pattern like that. It's called the, um, it's a variable zone plate. So the idea is in the corner, well, we have two versions where one's inverted of the other, where in the corners, we start out single pixel and then it goes, uh, they increase pixels horizontal and vertically as it goes across the screen. Right. And then, but the problem, that's great, great for uh, display, but for projectors, we which use lenses in which are sharper in the center than they are at the edges. Well, we have the version that's inverted where, where, it's, where the, whole, the, the whole pattern is the same all the way across the screen. Right. Well, we do that with single pixel. I think we don't, I don't think we do it with anything more than single pixel. You probably should do it like single pixel and two by two and four by four and so on, because it, I, I think the current projectors really are not going to be able to resolve all those single pixels anywhere near that at the corners and even perhaps in the dead center. But what you'll be able to do is to tell at what point you can see the pixel if it's two by two or three, three by three or four by four. Usually with, a, with any kind of digital projector, you should be able to see the boundaries of the pixels and that'll tell you whether it's in focus. I mean, if you're, if you're checking for flat focus, which I, you know, is tough on, on a projector, but you should be able to see whether it's in focus across the whole field by just looking for the pixel boundaries, you know, using the pair of binoculars or something like that. Yeah, well, we've looked at some projectors uh, with a four by four pattern and you can't see the pixels at all on the edge. Mm. You see chromatic aberration. So we did yeah. an interesting we experiment. We need something to quantify that so that the manufacturers... I see, right. Say, Look, take, take this $10,000 projector and put like a $5,000 lens on it that, with a, that has a APO lenses. You know, and, you know, because there are going to be some consumers who want to resolve the, four, the 4K pixels. I mean, for the most part, 
you're getting a 120 inch picture. The average person doesn't give a damn about the sharpness because they've got great color, great black levels finally, and you have to hell with the sharpness. But at some point, why not resolve the 4K pixels because that's what the, the content is. You might as well be able to see them. Mm. Well, one of the issues with like LCOS is LCOS can't resolve single pixel. That's right. So one of the issues with like LCOS projection, like the JVCs, is they can't actually resolve a single pixel. They kind of get, right. when you put up a checkerboard, they do this sort of weird thing. Yeah. Mm. Whereas like OLED, or not OLED, uh, uh, DLP could actually resolve single pixel, but there is no real 4K DLP except in the cinema. Right. right. This, yeah, the yeah. wobulation causes them to not be able to totally resolve single yeah. pixels as well for other reasons. So, yeah. Right. Well, I'm, I, I, I mean, one of the one of the things that they're dealing with the projection ship can resolve the six pixels, but the lenses so far I've looked at. Not, right. I started as a photographer before I became an, an, an audiophile, so this is very important to me. I don't want to spend ten grand on a projector and 4K. And the lens doesn't resolve the pixels. You know, you can't see any pixels anywhere. So in and, D cinema, you actually choose the lens based on the, you know, and they have much more expensive lenses. In the home, you'll never have a lens that's expensive enough to do what you want. Yeah. Right. Well, One of the things that the manufacturers are, right? sorry, sorry, Jane. Um, one of the things the manufacturers are dealing with is that their analysis is that for the most part, 4K already, and a lot of the the a lot of this is basically just for marketing. Like they don't think that the average consumer can see the difference between say 1080p and 4k. And on a lot of content, it is hard to see the difference, right? Even on a really good display. I don't have that good a vision and I can see the difference really easily. just on my 75 inch LED TV, well, I can see it. You are it. not the average consumer, JJ. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, None of us here are, you know. Has better vision than I do. They can see it if I point it out to you. Look at this. Right. And, but, say, oh, and so th this is the tricky thing is they're trying to sell hundreds of thousands of these things and they are trying to, they're, they're in the mass market, you know, and we're not the target demo you know like so so I what agree. we are trying to do in many ways is try to highlight these problems so that other people will care about them so that eventually like people that get it right will sell more because ultimately the consumer electronics companies that's all they respond to is is this selling or is it not selling if we can get people to see things like a chroma bug or see that the resolution is not being fully resolved or whatever, then they start caring and they start saying, well, I want to get this model or this brand because they care about the details and they get it right. And then things change, you know? So there was interest in selling, you know, 5 million projectors that don't do all that well, except for brightness and big in size and so on. Right, right. 10,000 projectors that have a superb lens on it. Okay, well, here's, yeah. here's, here's a silly, I mean, silly, question for me then i mean there, there's not really a projector that's going to accurately compare with say like a an oled uh, like an oled panel or a right. mini led panel i mean just there's just there's I not mean, it's one thing you're talking about talking about size of a picture and stuff but the the contrast the light output i mean it's they're, they're two different two different things right i mean anyone yeah. who's going to buy projector is not i mean they're mainly going for screen size they're not if they if they're if they want clarity of picture and 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 the contrast and all that stuff and they're gonna they're gonna sort of go for a panel basically right right yep and so. it's sort of the psychological appeal i think um if you are a cinema file you like that experience of seeing that the picture projected and there's yeah. just something about it psychologically appealing you know, well a projected know, image looks different than a uh the emissive right. display. I mean, even though I love the, I love an OLED, there's still just something different about projecting, reflecting off the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So I did see this experiment done. I forget the size of the display, but basically it was, they took a 4K image. It was just all little pixels lit up and they turned off one pixel, or I think they made the pixel red and you could see the red pixel. Then they did the same thing at 8K resolution and you couldn't see the red pixel. Hmm. So that's a pretty good demonstration that 8K may not be... Viewable. Just be, that's what I'm saying because there are so many pixels and the fill factor is so small. I think 8K at this point is just an experiment by the C manufacturers to see if people want. You know, I mean, it's the it's it's more. You know, it goes to 11. You know what I mean? Like they just they're trying to find a new buzzword that's going to get people to buy a new TV. 
Um, they're not the 8K displays aren't selling very well. I, even I think right. it's in, this last shootout showed that only the OLEDs can actually resolve 8K. Like the LCD, mm -hmm. 8K LCDs, they do not do it. Because I have a mm -hmm. 8K LCD right here, and it it does not look good. It does mm -hmm. not look like 8K. I think we're hitting a saturation point, at, or at least a at least a limit at the moment of what you know people are going to buy. Because I think I think yeah, the, in terms of the content and both, if if people can actually tell the difference between four and 8K, I think we've sort of hit a well, Unless, still, until something else happens or that, that that we surpass that next level, you know, qualitatively or or that they're noticeably, I, I don't know. I don't a know. A lot of the 4K content you watch today is still mastered at HD resolution and then scaled to 4K for distribution. Now, right. streaming services, ironically, are the ones that have true 4K content. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. There are discs that are true for 4K. 8K, but... uh, sorry, for 8K streaming, you're going to need four times the bandwidth. Well, you also have newer codecs like um, I forget H two six six what it's called VVC I think. Anyways, it's more efficient. It's basically twice as efficient as HEVC is. I think it's mm. called VVC. Interesting. Well, the crazy thing about compression is that you can do eight K at roughly the same bandwidth as you know you're running four K, and it will still look like an image. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, to get the same level of quality all the way down to the final pixels, you do need more bandwidth. Right. But, you know, that's the that's the dirty secret is that lossy compression allows you to kind of tune in, like, how much bandwidth do you want to devote? You know, they could mm -hmm. devote 2x, 1.5x. They could devote exactly the same amount, you know? I mean, at the Value Electronic Shootout, they I think the AK was at around 100 megabits. So... It was the same that we had 4K out on our disc, and you couldn't tell. You didn't see any compression artifacts. It worked. It looked really good. Mm. Very good. Anyway. Cool. Interesting. Right. But there's no there's no commercially produced 8K content. I mean, there's a lot of stuff shot at 8K. It's just not obviously mastered and delivered at 8K, which was one of the things we actually wanted to do for the disc. We shot 8K, we mastered in 8K, and we finished in 8K. Yeah, and for, I think for a lot of the movies in the last couple of years that were. You had 4K discs, they were mastered in, in 1080p, I think. Mean. There's a lot of them that are, yeah. At least a lot of the visual effects stuff is, because it's expensive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they've got to render every pixel when they're building VFX or these um, digitally animated, you know, films. If Pixar wants to go to eight, a whole 8K pipeline, that is a lot of servers and a lot of bandwidth and a lot of, I mean, everything. And a lot of money. Yeah. yeah, a lot of money. <laughs> And all the animators have got to have an 8K display on their desktop so they can look at the finished product and stuff like that. It's like, I don't think they're going to go to 8K anytime soon at Pixar or, you know, any of the other digital animation the houses. Like, any other places, yeah. Yeah, yeah, or ILM or whatever, you know. Um, I'm not sure what they're rendering at right now, but it's probably 2K. Or are they doing 4K? So... When we did the presentation for the MyTech committee, ASC MyTech, remember we met the guy from Pixar? Mm, oh right, yeah. And he had mentioned it's like some of their Blu-ray releases are a lot of it's HD and some of it's actually 4K inside of it. So they'll mm -hmm. actually render some scenes that are important in 4K, and some of it will be scaled up. Interesting. And some are, and newer ones mm -hmm. are obviously rendered in 4K. But. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, yeah I imagine. Interesting. Do, do, uh, do commercial theaters now mostly have 4K projectors? I don't know. I haven't been to a movie theater in a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it would, it's, it's not going to be cheap for them to do that. You know? I think if you're building a new movie theater, you're going to put in a 4K projector. That's Whether true. or not every movie theater has a 4K projector, I don't know. Well, I think, yeah, I I think going to the Dolby Cinema for their, I don't know if there's this 4K, but it's the HDR, I think, is the bigger aspect, or EDR. Mm -hmm. With the improved black level, the 108 nits. Well, I just went to see the uh, Taylor Swift Eras Tour at the Dolby Cinema up in Woodenville that we went to see one of the Star Wars films at. It looked very good. It looked very, very good. Mm. One of the complaints that I have about the commercial theaters, at least here in Redwood City, which is AMC, and at least in the movies I saw, I have been for a couple of years, is that they, they show the movies at constant width rather than constant height. So the widescreen movies are just the same width but chopped down instead of blowing it up. Like, right. this is the reason CinemaScope got invented is so that they could <laughs> expand it sideways. Now they just show the movies at all the same same uh, width, and I stopped going. 
wait till you go to a movie and they actually show it the scope, the shape of a phone. So it's super tall and very narrow. I'm going to walk right out of that one. <laughs> oh, man. Uh. But earlier, JJ, you mentioned Brian Florian. Uh, Brian actually, he's worked on all of our discs, including this latest one. Mm, what does he do? So he designs the cover. He'll design a couple of the patterns of motion ones and after effects for us. So like the stock ticker one, he designed that. Like we tell him what he wants, he actually creates it for us. Hmm. But what definitely he designs it? the covers. He does, he lays out all the our, the, um, the instructions for us. So we'll write the text and he'll lay it out, format it for us. You're talking about the, the marketing still shots? Of it no, like the little booklet that's included. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. But definitely oh, the front and back cover, he designs all that. Very cool. All kinds of secrets alumni involved in uh, yeah. involved in this, actually. And Brian, <laughs> Colin, and I will occasionally have conversations. Very neat, very neat. So, stay, so how did you guys eventually sort just sort of find each other, like or like with JJ or whatever? And how did you guys get involved? How did you guys like back then, sort of? Well, so that's what I was trying to remember how I met JJ. Um, I'm trying to figure out, I, I'm having a hard time remembering how I found secrets because again, there was no Google. Right. I think I, I think it was through Hotbot because I never used Yahoo. I think mostly Hotbot, maybe AltaVista were the search engines. And there was no AVS forum back then because this is around 96, 97. Mm -hmm. But I remember finding secrets and just emailing JJ because I think and, I had a Meridian player at the time. And, and that's just how it, it just sort of started from there yeah. then okay and i mean there really wasn't really any other online av community or anything at the time was there besides maybe message oh. boards or things like that or no i don't remember any but i do remember one of the things that was difficult being the first internet magazine or one of the first is none of the companies believed you because everything was printed magazine they're like oh you're online that's not a real thing and we still get a lot of that actually <laughs> <laughs> exactly. like, everybody's online now the brain exactly is right brain. and it's it's funny it's funny even though the print magazines are are having a, are starting to have a harder time now the, the, you'll still get manufacturers that are, that are like yeah but we're still gonna we're, we still want to send all our big stuff to the print magazines because they're the print magazines and it's like right that's that's starting to change now and it's been how many years you know, you know? well I don't know if you did it more than one year but there was one year where JJ actually had a booth at CES we had booths several years and it several was ten thousand dollars yeah booth I remember the one year I don't remember. The other years, though, I remember you yeah. made jackets for us. At one year, I still had the jacket. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I I came on to see in, involved in secrets. I think about eleven years ago. So this was this was I, I we didn't have a booth uh, the times I was at CES. <laughs> it was like, well, I'm trying to remember because they they uh, they don't want you to carry your stuff in and out because it's all union. So I remember it was like grabbing all our stuff and sneaking out as fast as possible yeah. to save money. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Because it wasn't off at the the sideshow. I think it was literally at the CES convention center. Yeah, yeah, on the on the main floor. Yeah. Oh wow, jeez. So I guess I so I was gonna say. I mean, was there anything else? Was there anything that, in your perspective, kind of made secrets different from other AV forums or websites at the time? But I guess there wasn't any. Yeah, <laughs> it was the only one. <laughs> we were kind of the only one. So I think oh, there man. were a few. There, I think. Some of the print magazines were starting to put a little bit of stuff on the web, but not really articles, mostly just promotion for the print magazine and kind of, and there might have been a discussion forum, maybe not AVS forum, but I don't know. I vaguely recall that Secrets wasn't the only thing out there. It was just the most robust, had the most content, had you mm -hmm. know more going on. Because yeah, at the time I joined Secrets, it was still before I went to Microsoft. And so that was when I was living in Southern California. Like I can literally remember what the cubicle I worked in at the company, <laughs> but I just don't remember anything else. <laughs> yes. That's all right. Oh, cool. Cool. Um, so I, I mean, did, uh, this is a bit of a, a toot our own horn question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, did being involved with the secrets kind of open any doors for you career wise stuff, uh, or, or lead into any other thing? I mean, obviously the DVD benchmark and going, taking that, to where it is now but any other things at all or well i think if there was no secrets i'm not sure if there was no dvd benchmark well if there's no secrets there's no dvd benchmark if there's no dvd benchmark i probably never would have met don we never would have created discs i'm not sure if oppo would have how they would have built a player if they would have i mean would of still be here <laughs> exactly <laughs> we'd still be dealing with this darn chroma book <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh, very cool so well, like you... there was a, I think um, 
It was the Chromabug article was the first time, I think it was the BBC had sent JJ a letter. They wanted to use it internally to train their employees. The BBC did? Yeah, it was some some part of the BBC. We got a lot of feedback on that article because among other things, it really explained, it was the best explanation of how interlace and progressive scan really worked and how chroma up sampling worked and stuff. It was, there wasn't anything that described it at that point in that level of detail, except maybe Charles Poynton's books. And those were pretty dry and technical. So to write, we wrote something, we spent a lot of time on that. I remember Stacy and me and Brian worked on that article a lot and trying to find a way to explain how interlace works, how progressive scan works, how deinterlacing works, all the different techniques and processes and how it really, really works. I'm still sort of make it approachable then as, as uh, something. Well, really approachable, really but also correct. You know, right. it's often in, in journalism, you know, you see people describing technical issues and they, they're trying to make it accessible and they get it wrong. Right. You know, in this case, it was engineers writing an article about an engineering topic, but also trying to make it accessible to the end user. So you could read it and go, oh, now I see how this really works. Right. And we were we put a lot of energy into that. And a lot of people really liked it, even if they weren't that into progressive scan DVD players, because it explained in explicit detail exactly how interlace works, how progressive scan works, what was really going on. I think a lot of people appreciated that. We got a lot of feedback on that article. And um, even from within the press, from people, um, people who worked at other magazines, people were like, wow, I never really understood how interlace really worked before. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was a big deal. That article was, nice. was huge for us. That was, that made a big difference. That, that, that's always, I'm sorry. And that's always been a thing with me. I mean, I, I'm an artist by trade, so I don't do not have any sort of engineering background. But I've always I've always loved the technical aspect of you know audio reviews and and video reviews. But a lot of times when you get into the technical aspect of things, I always have encountered it being you know either very dry or hard to or hard to sort of digest and figure out what's going on. And that's always been the biggest thing for me is finding finding that sort of material in in an accessible way where it's kind of like ah okay i get this i and, and it makes it click and that's always that's always the, been the hardest thing to find in in, in my opinion um yeah. so it's, it's great that you guys like took the time to make it to make it so that's understandable yeah yeah so that's very cool that's very very cool um but so, going back to but even so that then that wouldn't have led to me going to the codec team that wouldn't have led to me then actually working at uh spectracal on Calman, which then wouldn't have led to me being at Red today working on movie cameras. So it, I'm, just, I'm saying if there was no secrets, I don't know what I'd be doing today. Oh, It'd be completely really different. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, well it's a good. Thing. John, you created a beast, man. That's awesome. <laughs> Had the domino not fallen, you know. Exactly. I have a habit of doing that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have um, a lot of uh, people always ask me questions about the thing that is it. This seems so obvious. How did you think about it? This idea, and it just, I don't know. I remember one of the other manufacturers when it was just getting ready to start sequence. I told him, I'm going to put uh, an AB publication on the web. And he talked about it to a lot of people. He said, oh, he's, going to, he's going to create a magazine on the internet. Now that's where they all are. Although a lot of them move to YouTube now. I mean, YouTube's got yeah. a huge. Yes, I see a new YouTube. Uh, audio file review this guy There's at least once a week fistfuls of them come Running out daily out they call themselves you know i know it's this is like it's like a whole it's a whole other cottage industry right there right but the, the quality you get on youtube today is better than we got with hd broadcast oh yeah yeah i, I know mean, streaming over these... the internet it's just it's impressive how good image quality is today streaming and a lot of these people right. are shooting this stuff on like their iphones or whatever i mean yeah. and it's 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 pretty amazing the, the quality you can get so you know, more more power to the to the self publisher than yeah for sure. Um, so I, I guess it's sort of in my uh, our last question or my last question anyway I have is um, where do you see the AV industry going in the next few years and is there anything that you guys see in terms of emerging technologies and stuff that you're excited about? Well, I wish I was into VR because the new Apple headset's really pretty cool. But is it? I'm, I'm not. A, I mean, the image quality is is really impressive. Yeah, watching a movie. 
It looks good. So you've actually you've actually had some hands on time with it. And, the headset, yeah. Oh wow. Okay. What is what's the resolution of the image? It's four K per eye. Four K per eye, and, yeah. and so they, easy to do three D, right? Yes, the three D looks really good on it. That's why I'm surprised Don hasn't bought one yet. So. And can you adjust the angle of view so you can adjust the interocular? 120 inches or whatever you want. You mean the image size or the distance between the the two eyes? No, no, for just uh, not 3D, but just you know, single. So you can you don't so you can. Well, you, oh, you have you end up with a high or low. It creates a virtual screen that hangs in the air, so you can make that as big as you want. So it can subtend as you know as much of your of your view as you want. So you can change um, the It's basically size. like, yeah. I'm sorry. You can change the size. Yes. Yeah. You can grab it and resize so it. The yeah. 4K per eye, obviously, not every pixel is devoted to the image of the. If you're watching a video, you know, you're getting less than 4K on that video because it's also rendering like the environment around it and stuff. Well, still does some, I think it's still doing foveated rendering because it doesn't have the horsepower yet to, I think, render all the resolution. So as you move, it gets sharper. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh. Something slightly mm. creepy about that. I don't know. Just maybe just mm. me. I think it just. I don't know that. I don't know. I think I've bought into the whole thing about being immersed inside like a, a headset well, it's, yet. I, it's it's going to be funny once know. you see everyone on the airplane doing it. Right, everyone puts their thing on and it's just going to work. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think that just gives me the willies. Uh, but the battery only lasts a couple hours. So if you, but if I if I flew on a plane a lot, I think I would have one. But I just can't see spending the money on it right now. What would you connect it to if you were on an airplane? Your laptop. No, no, it's a built-in computer. It's got storage on it. Oh. It is its own computer. Or a movie on it? Yeah. How yeah. much storage does it have? You can get it you can get a 500 megabytes or 500 gigabytes a terabyte. Oh, okay. 512 and a terabyte, yeah. No, I just want to need something else stuff. something else to be strapped to. Oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. But again, if you're into 3D and VR, I think it's really cool. It's just that's not my thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of I like disconnecting from the internet these days. Because yeah. you know the, the cell phone is basically a digital leash, and so I have a lot of friends that get mad at me because I keep my phone in my bedroom, and so I walk around the house without my phone, and people get mad because they don't get instant responses from me. I think I'm a bit the same way. Uh, <laughs> mm, it's just I'm just too connected all the time, and it's kind of exactly. like I'm just trying to like you know, get get a few breaks in there, being uh, being digitally tied into everything. Right, like I have a LinkedIn account because you can never delete LinkedIn. It's like the Hotel California; you can never leave. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I've got a Facebook account, but it's deactivated most of the time because I got tired of all the political fighting. So I'm mm -hmm. pretty much not online except when I go to like YouTube or a forum or something. Mm -hmm. I have to go to it, but yeah, I don't. I'm not on Instagram. Not on Snapchat anymore. Just disconnected. Oh, wow. That's well, you're definitely a little little more off the grid than <laughs> than most people I know. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, Stacy, for being a very technologically oriented person, is not you know only in very specific areas. You know, when it comes to his movies, he wants the latest and hottest technology, but otherwise, he's like a luddite. <laughs> he's like oh, leave and, me alone. <laughs> and his car washes. You know, his he has the world's most high tech car washing setup, but that's a whole other thing. There we are. <laughs> Just everyone's got to have a hobby. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Oh man. Well, I, I, that's kind of everything I got, John. Do you? Is there anything else you wanted to ask? Or uh, covered it all. Covered it all. Are, are you oh, still working man. on medical magazines, John? No, I retired from the two medical journals I was editing maybe about ten years ago. It's, um, uh, it just everything just got to be too much. I couldn't do it all at the same time, <laughs> and I um, liked Secrets of Home Theater better than I liked reading. About neuroscience. <laughs> We're I more still fun. Have in there than to keep up with what's going on, but I don't edit, edit medical journals anymore. So before you blur your background, though, your office looked like I remember it. So yeah. <laughs> it hasn't changed. Yeah. Oh, hey, and you're predicting um, the future. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, make a prediction that you know, just to try to manifest it and put it out there that we'll see another resurgence of 3D. You know, 3D movies, 3D. Mm. I don't know whether it's going to be good because of the Apple Vision Pro or, you know, Avatar more 12. Avatar movies <laughs> or something like that. But no, like the technology is all there. You know, all the, the manufacturers can just spin it up again and they can start building more 3D panels and stuff. And I think I've been I think curious. Gonna... I've been curious about that because, I mean, you know, when you saw it at some of those shows like the 3D 
for a few years ago. It's like it, you know, it it it, it was impressive and it made a statement, but it's just maybe it was just too early or the, the time wasn't right for it or so or, or going something. Going back to like know. sensor sensor resolution in 8K sensor, uh, Canon makes a lens that's a, basically got dual dual lenses on it. So you can shoot stereo from a single lens and it just splits it down the frame. So if you have an 8K capture camera, put that lens on it. Now you've got two 4K images stereo. Yeah. That's been used a lot for uh, VR. And you're off to the races then. Yeah. yeah, I met the guy who's one of the designers of that at the National Stereoscopic Association convention last summer. I sat next to him at the banquet. So I ended up talking to him pretty extensively. It was it was very interesting. Yeah, They have a convention well, for everything now. But stereoscopic convention. That's uh, first. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Well, one of the projects, one of the projects I worked on, basically they used two of our cameras back to back with that lens on it. So for VR 180, so it was really pretty cool. So mm -hmm. they did that for the Beijing Olympics for FIFA. Really darn. Yeah, I don't. I you know, it's I've been a fan of 3D for for a lot of years. I take 3D photography, and you know, I we did that 3D disc largely because. I don't know. I harangued Stacy into doing it. He was like, I don't know about this. And I was like, come on, we got to do 3D. We got to do 3D test patterns. Well, the only 3D test pattern is. And our new disc is 3D because of HDR. It's that depth that it gives you from that ultra contrast. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, I, you know, Stacy borrowed movie, another another red thinking, camera. So we shot 3D. You think in movie theaters they'll ever be able to figure out a way to have 3D without using glasses? I don't, they'll have to have some sort of way of separating the images. I know it's technically very complicated. It is potentially doable. It has been done for demonstration purposes, but it's very hard to get the resolution and so forth. It's, it's, nobody's really worked out a good way of doing it without some kind of glasses. Um, or and the theaters don't make money. Skull. I don't think it's the glasses <laughs> that really killed 3D. And I don't know that. I don't know the 3D is dead. I mean, that's the, the thing is that they're still doing 3D showings. Like when Avatar 2 came out, something like 70% of the tickets sold were 3D. Like everybody was like, oh, Avatar, I want to see that in 3D. So even weeks and weeks after it came out, if you looked in the at the showings, they were showing as many of the showings as possible in 3D. They usually only had a few in 2D and then the rest were 3D because that's what people wanted. What, did, what kind of glasses were used for this? Just the regular, you know, polarized glasses, depending okay. on if it's IMAX. So if we're going to go down this, so we're going to go down this 3D rabbit hole. The biggest complaint I've always had with 3D is like being a glasses wear, actually having glasses that would cover my glasses or whatever, so that so that I would still see the 3D image and be immersed in it, as opposed to kind of it, yeah. you know, being coming crazy. coming yeah. out of out of 3D. If I'm like, you know, I just happen my peripheral vision happens to go out of. Uh, <laughs> You know, well, I can I can tell you a source where you can get clip on glasses. It'll clip over your glasses. But I don't know. It's <laughs> it's never bothered me that much. I mean, I've had the same problem my whole life, but it's it's not really that big a deal. I don't know. For me, my solution but, is to not need glasses. So there you I'll go. You go. Yeah, we'll, talk, um, we'll talk to get some LASIK done for that. <laughs> it's actually a bigger problem for me at like Disney parks because they tend to use a different system. They use the Dolby um, 3D system, which was licensed from Infinitech. And for some reason, you have to look straight through the center of the glasses to get the 3D effect to work. If you're looking off edge, off axis, you know, you're kind of looking through the edge of the glasses, the 3D just collapses. Well, so like a, uh, yeah. And so... Like if you're on uh, Star Tours or um, what's the other thing? Anyway, the Star Tours is a good good example. Depending on where you're sitting, you know, you're kind of looking around the system, looking around the, the capsule and looking around the screen and all your peripheral vision is flat and you're seeing a double image instead of a 3D image. And then if you turn your head, it now pops mm -hmm. into 3D. It's an annoying system for that reason. And I don't know whether it's just a limitation of the glasses, a limitation of, I don't know, mm -hmm. I, but I don't really have that problem seeing 3D in theaters with the polarized, but some people do. Like if you tilt your head, the 3D gets very um, tough to watch. And mm -hmm. I suspect I was at a 3D movie not that long ago and I saw somebody like leaning her head on her boyfriend's shoulder and i was like this is ruining the, the 3d for you but you know like yeah you know do you you have to stay upright and you know with your eyes like this in order to enjoy the 3d you know and mm -hmm. 
So that woman was getting a really headachey experience, I would think. And that that probably bothers people somewhat. But I think that and the level of brightness too. You think you need a, a bright enough image to kind of make things pop, help make things pop. And that I think the biggest thing is for many people, it's like, well, it's nice and they like it, but they want to be sure that a the film is going to be good, the three D is going to be good. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be this conversion that looks weird the whole time. Um, and they want to make sure, as you say, it's going to be bright, and they don't want to have to pay a whole lot extra for it. You know, unless, again, it's Avatar, you know. Like. So in AB a few years ago, when Billy Lynn's Halftime Walk or whatever it was came out, we had a 15-minute presentation of it. So we saw it in 3D, in high frame rate, in HDR. And it was Ooh. pretty spectacular. I can imagine, yeah. I'd be damned. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and the Hobbit movies were done high frame rate, um, 3D. And I saw them, and it is an impressive technology. I... I feel like the movies were not as good as I wanted them to be. So but that's a different you know, thing. <laughs> the fact that they were in high frame rate HDR, you know, 3D was like cool, but you know, it, yeah. the movie wasn't as good as I was. It doesn't it doesn't for. save the film, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's if you're gonna charge people extra for 3D and it's a significant amount extra, I think that's gonna always tough. That's I always heard 3D. And I've, what I heard from through the grapevine, mostly from, well, is that the TV manufacturers, they were getting more returns on their 3D TVs. Like, mm -hmm. it wasn't like a huge extra expense to add 3D to a TV. Um, it's just that, and they thought, of, oh, this is an opportunity for upsell. We can sell more glasses, you know, right. whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like, we, but um but they were, you know, if they take more returns because people get at home and the 3D doesn't seem to work for them or they don't like the 3D or whatever, you know, each of them had different issues. If you had shutter glasses, those glasses have to be char charged. And, uh, you know, and if it uses passive, then suddenly the vertical alignment becomes really a problem. And if you if you mount the TV up high and are looking up at it, the 3D collapses. Oh, you have to be looking that. at it directly. You know, you've got to be your eye line has got to be roughly perpendicular to the screen. Okay. So if you're going to mount it up high, you've also got to tilt it down. So when you look at it from your seating position, you're, you're still looking, looking at straight it. at it. Yeah. Okay. And they never explained that clearly in the instructions. Plus, if they had, do people even read the instructions when they're mounting a TV? They're not. You right. Know, it's right. a tricky problem from the. It's this extra technology that. Um, you know, they have to, if they contend if they take with and it becomes, it's, it's just an extra thing that they have to deal with. And some people that's great with and others, it's kind of like, I don't need this extra hassle. And the problem is, you, you know, I always wondered, why didn't they just pick one high end model and say this one as an upsell, we're going to keep 3D on it. And it turned out it's just like a economy of scale thing. It's like in order for the technology to be viable, they got to be able to sell a certain number Right. of these things right. to make it worth having a production line for it and everything. It's not like a simple thing where they can just slap it on and call it, a, you know, a, an upsell, like making that 3d panel was, was a complicated process and they've got to sell, you know, 50,000 or a hundred thousand of those panels in order to make it work. Yeah. yeah. And the number of enthusiasts like me who, you know, will spend extra to get a 3d TV and really love the 3d it's just not high enough, you know, it's not high enough to be viable. It's really annoying. Mm. Yeah, for the projector, man, it, you can still get a 3D projector now. Most DLP projectors, in fact, are 3D c capable because that literally is just a software change. Like DLP, Texas Instruments worked out a way to just use their existing chip and add 3D to it. It doesn't require any other components. Oh, it's just, hard. it's all done with the chip. It's a technologically a very clever thing. They send the signal using the DLP chip in between frames. They put up a burst of red during the red part of the wheel. Mm -hmm. They put a little burst that is red by the glasses on the screen. So the sensor in the glasses is looking for a modulated red burst that's got a code and the code is basically telling it, okay, the next frame is coming up, open the glasses in, X nanoseconds or whatever. That'll be darn. And yeah, so 
if you watch the thing without the glasses on, everything turns red because you're getting this extra red burst on the screen. Hmm. But you put on the glasses, both glasses close during the burst. So you don't see it and the image looks yeah. perfect and they don't need infrared. They don't need radio frequency. The signal to tell the glasses to change is on the screen, which I just find, I love that. I think that's just super cool technically. But It's very crafty. Yeah. yeah. So the nice thing about that is if you have the software, which text, you know, if you have the firmware to say is 3D capable, there's no extra components. It's all just, you know, as long as you got 120 hertz um, projector, which almost all DLP projectors now are, it can just handle the 3D signal and display it on the screen. So today you can buy like a ViewSonic or Optima projector and DLP projector and buy DLP glasses and presto, you got 3D. But what, what do commercial movie theaters use as projectors? They use DLP now or, or laser or what? They use a variety of systems, but a lot of DLP, as my understanding, just high end, you know, professional DLP. And they use a switching, most of them use a switching um, polarizer. So the polarizer is synchronized with the projector. And so the projector is running at some multiple of 24 and it's alternating back and forth between left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye. And the polarizer is switching back and forth, 90 degree polarization. Um, could they, could they switch that to the red burst thing and everybody just buy their own glasses and bring them to the movie theaters when they go? Well, that wouldn't be a problem for people. Yeah, I don't think that that's not the way they do it in the theaters. In the theaters, they use um, in the theaters, they use uh, passive glasses. So they're using a silver screen and polarizers because mm -hmm. they they're not going to give everybody active glasses. I did once go to an IMAX movie where they gave everybody active shutter glasses, but you know, those are like expensive. They have to yeah, collect them so. after the, like they're not throwaways. Uh, so well, I mean, if everybody just buys their set of glasses when they want to, to take the movie theaters to watch 3D with the closed shutter. Yeah, I don't see that happening. I think they, I th I, that just doesn't seem like, like well, someone would forget get, their glasses or someone would bring yeah. them non-charged. It would be all kinds of problems. And I think the theater would have yeah. to give you the shutter glasses. But the reason the theaters don't want to use shutter glasses is shutter glasses are expensive. And right. they would rather have cheap throw, you know, disposable glasses. Right. I mean, you do recycle them in a special bin after the show. And those are recycled. <laughs> hmm, are they now? Yes. <laughs> well, Decontaminated you know, maybe. Or <laughs> yeah. The fancy uh, Dolby Vision, Dolby 3D glasses they use at the theme parks, those are actually cleaned and cycled back through because they're like $25 glasses. Oh, but wow. okay. the glasses that you um, get in the movie theater, they're like 15 cents. So they're mm. recycled. I assume Star Tours glasses are cleaned? Yeah, Star Tours is the so. Dolby. Yeah, okay. so they, they run them through like a big industrial, you know, glasses washer. Mm. And... Uh, you know, dryer, and then they bring them out again because they got to reuse those. Those are expensive. But the polarized glasses they used to use, those were super cheap. Yeah, 15, 20 cents. So if people took a pair after the show, no big deal. They didn't care. I don't know whether they washed them or whether they just, you know, recycled them in this. But it's Disney, actually. So I wouldn't be surprised if Disney did something ecologically sound because Disney is behind the scenes. They actually really try to to recycle and to do everything as an ecologically sound a way as they can. So I wouldn't be surprised if they cleaned them or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure they do. Being a former exactly. employee, I'm sure they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway. Well, guys, um, well, 3D 3D's returning. I said it. I'm making it happen. <laughs> Make it so. <laughs> it's like, yes. that's, that's awesome. That's right. Right. Well, guys, thank you so oh, much. Oh, uh, oh sorry. Coraline go 3D is coming back to theaters in August. And if you like 3D and you you like a good 3D movie that was really well made and the 3D is really good, Coraline probably has the best 3D of any movie ever made. I it is prepared. amazing in 3D. When it comes back to theaters in August in 3D, go out of your way to see it. It is totally worth seeing. In 3D. I, have, I have the Blu-ray mm -hmm. set that's got a that's got a. The, of the 3d disc in it with the with just the the polarized glasses and i mean with the limitations that it is it's still it still looked really cool and it's my youngest son's favorite movie so yeah i'll definitely make sure to take him to see that oh, that'll, yeah. be, that'll be really what's cool. the name of the movie again Coraline. Coraline. 
It's a it was like a stop motion animated film almost. Um, like a Tim Burton style. Like a Tim Burton style film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was made by Leica, which used to be um, Will Vinton Studios in Portland, mm-hmm. Oregon. I actually got to tour their studios years ago at another stereoscopic convention, which was in Portland. And it's amazing. It's amazing. The the 3D on that is amazing. They do things like it's it's a fantasy film where it starts in the real world. And at some point, the main character, Coraline, goes to another world, which is more colorful and you know, a little mysterious and creepy. And because they wanted the other world to feel a little off kilter, they increased the depth of mm-hmm. the other world. So there's the subtlety you can only see in the 3D version, which is that everything in the other world is a little deeper than normal. Like yeah. the 3D yeah. is enhanced and everything yeah. feels a little bit like it's, they do a bunch of really cool things in that movie that I, I have not seen in other movies. I would so have loved 3D to see years, It is like the, Tip top of the heap. I would have loved to have seen their movie Paranorman in 3D. I love that movie. That also Leica, yeah. yeah. Leica, all of their films are great in 3D. Box Trolls, Paranorman, um, Coraline. One of the directors of Box Kubo Trolls. One of the directors of Box Trolls, Graham Annabelle. I went to college with him. We're good, uh-huh. uh, good friends. Yeah, yeah. We we studied animation together. Great, great guy. Very talented. Isn't he the same guy that did? He did a couple of puzzle games. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's Graham Annable, right? Yep, he's yeah. got he's got a he's has a long standing comic strip called Grickle, which is uh, Grickle, yeah, which he started in college, which was which was great, yeah, super nice guy, yeah, yeah, I loved those games; those were a lot of fun. Yeah, puzzle games, yeah, yeah. Oh man, small world. <laughs> 3D, totally. Go see 3D, more, <laughs> see more 3D. Make it financially viable. Everybody watching this, commit to 3D. Also, buy a 3D camera and, uh, you know, stuff. <laughs> you got it, sir. Absolutely. Come to, the, <laughs> come to the National Stereoscopic Association Convention in Wichita. Everybody wants to go Wichita, to Wichita, right? Yeah. All right. In uh, uh, August of this year, you know. Honestly, it's like saying come, come to Dayton or, whatever, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, guys, uh, thank you very much for, for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And, um it's been this i know it's been a bit of a learning experience for me you know having haven't been with secrets as long as 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 you guys hadn't when you guys got involved but uh it's it's been a blast thank you thank you so much i really appreciate it a pleasure thanks for having us yeah you bet um jj nope that's it all right guys thanks again have a great day you too thank you You bet take care